the pressure on the district court level is to resolve cases. That means settle cases. That means plea bargaining. It also sometimes means um, writing, not writing a decision. Uh, three words on the side of a, of a pleading or an endorsement in a docket. Uh, and in fact, we once had a trainer come and talk to us and said, if you write a decision, you've lost. This was a judicial trainer. So the notion of the district court as the articulator, the common law court articulating principles in the first instance is often lost. Mm -hmm. Every six months, we're, we have to put in our um, six-month list to see how many cases are pending. That puts massive pressure. It's not bad to move the cases, but it puts enormous pressure on you to, uh, you know, if you're denying something, just write denied. Let me give you another example on sort of the ability to deal with both um, the particular and the abstract. One of the articles I'm writing in October is called Loser's Rules. And Loser's Rules is when you are granting summary judgment, the case goes away, you have to write a decision because the person has a right to appeal. If you're denying summary judgment, you don't have to write a decision. So a body of law evolves only in terms of the losing cases. And the next time the judge sees these cases, you see them, you, you envision them only in terms of frivolous cases or cases that are perceived to be. And that happens in all the areas in which, candidly, the Supreme Court and other courts have been most aggressive at, you know, sort of interposing pr procedural obstacles, discrimination law, pr prisoners' rights, um, et cetera. So loser's rules. Now, that's the kind of thing that literally came to me as a judge because I would say, gee, I'm denying summary judgment. I don't have to write anything. And then you realize uh, the parties would love to see what I'm writing or what I'm thinking about it. Maybe other judges having like cases might want to see it. But in a busy district court, that's not easy to do. I tried to be the kind of judge that I wanted to appear before. You know, I tell jurors that you should be the kind of juror that you want to have if you're in trouble. And so the question is, what does that mean? It meant I worked my heart off, my heart out in every case. And I wanted a judge that would, that would read what I've done. Um, you wanted a judge for whom, if you were not being perfunctory, he shouldn't or she shouldn't be perfunctory. Um, so that's, that's one thing. If people are going to do the time to uh, take the time to, to, you know, to, to raise interesting points, I want to make sure I appreciate those interesting points. I do think that the distortion of the system brought about by mass incarceration is something we have to deal with, profound distortion of the system, um, federal and state all across the country. I think it distorts sentencing. I think it distorts trials. Um, it distorts our docket. And I think that that, that is profoundly broken. With sentencing, we have created sentences that are not based on what works, that have no relationship to the crime rate, that have no relationship to recidivism, based on what felt good. Um, why is it that sentences typically go up 5, 10, 15, 20 by fives? For no apparent reason except sort of magical numerology. Um, we have to look at what works. We may not know how to solve crime, if there's even a concept, but we do know some things that we work. We know about drug addiction. Um, you know, we, we know that when you put people away for 20 years and then they come out to a world where the internet was not invented when they were in, what it takes to get them back on track is enormous. Well, maybe we could affect punishment with a lesser sentence and more resources at the end. Um, if, if we start looking at what works, and acknowledge when we don't know, but certainly look at what works, I think that there will be monumental changes. Too much of criminal justice has been all about symbolism and not about um, reality. And um, I, I don't have any patience for symbolic imprisonment of human beings. Um, people would say to me, I'll issue a decision, and someone would say, that's very courageous. And I'm a judge. I had this position for life. I go, what, what do you mean? They're going to vote us off the island? I mean, I don't understand this. Um, I, 
am, I'm not afraid to be criticized. And part of the reason I'm not afraid of being criticized is that I'll answer it. If you feel like you can't answer the criticism, then that's one thing. But one of the other reasons I wrote decisions is that I wanted to people to understand what I was doing. If I was going to be criticized for a sentence, you know, sentencing of someone, they would, the idea would be that they would understand why. You may disagree with the outcome, but no one could say that it wasn't thoughtful. So I think I feel like I can answer criticism, um, uh, you know, and, and, as lo and as long as I can, I'm not afraid, you know, of anything. When I run into judges who would uh, chide me for writing opinions, I don't have time to write opinions. Why are you doing that? I mean, I, you know, I'd say, think of it this way. Spend as much time on sentencing a human being as you do on your findings in a patent case. We just don't see it that way, but we should.